Hello, everyone, and welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Hal Levinka, and I'm the event director at the bookstore, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be collaborating with our friends at NYRB Classics once again to welcome Jhumpa Lahiri and Cynthia Zarin for a discussion of Natalia Ginsburg's Valentino and Sagittarius. While the pandemic has taken a toll across all of our lives, virtual programs like the one you're about to see have become bright spots in all of our evenings. And I want to give a huge thanks to Jhumpa and Cynthia for joining us today. So to a little bit of housekeeping, you should be able to see and hear our presenters, but they cannot see or hear you. So if you have a question, please click on the Q&A button that's right down here at the bottom of your screen to submit it. We will try to get through as many of those as we can at the end of the program. There's also a chat button that you can access over here uh, where I'll be posting a link to buy tonight's book uh, as well as some other relevant links. Um, a caveat for tonight's event and for all virtual programming, we're at the mercy of our home internet connections and server loads, so please bear with any technical issues that could arise. We will try to solve those quickly. And we'll be continuing our virtual event series all across the fall and into the spring, so head over to our website and sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. Uh, in two weeks, one that I want to mention happening on October 8th, we pick back up our NYRB series welcoming author Brian Dillon from London to discuss his new book, Suppose a Sentence, in conversation with Vincent Cunningham. And you can register for that event on our website as well. So now a little about our presenters and we'll kick things off. Jopa is the author of four works of fiction, Interpreter of Maladies, The Namesake, Unaccustomed to Earth, and The Lowland, and a work of nonfiction, in other words. She has received numerous awards, including the Pulitzer Prize, the Penn Hemingway Award, the Penn Malamud Award, and a 2014 National Humanities Award or Medal awarded by President Barack Obama, among many others. And Cynthia is the author of, most recently, Two Cities, a book about Venice and Rome, out on David Sperner Books as of last month, and five books of poetry, most recently Orbit, as well as five books for children and a collection of essays and enlarged heart. She teaches at Yale and lives in New York City. Jumpa and Cynthia, the stage is yours. Okay. Um, we uh, thank you all for coming um, and to hear us talk about Natalia Ginsburg. And one thing uh, we thought was that it would be really nice to uh, hear the Italian. So uh, we're going to begin, Jim was going to read a couple of paragraphs of the opening of Valentino in Italian, and then I will read the same paragraphs in um, English, and then we will go from there. Thank you, Cynthia. Good evening to everybody who's joining us. Buonasera a tutte e tutti. Uh, I also would like to thank the community bookstore, which was once my neighborhood bookstore. Um, I lived right around the corner for many years and um, continue to be very fond of it. Um, and I'm so delighted to be um, talking about Natalia tonight with, with Cynthia. Um, so as a uh, as Cynthia mentioned, we're going to start off with this, uh, a little taste of the beginning of Valentino in Italian, and then Cynthia will read the same uh, section in English. Abitavo con mio padre, mia madre e mio fratello in un piccolo alloggio del centro. Avevamo la vita dura e non si sapeva mai come pagare l'affitto. Mio padre era un maestro di scuola a riposo e mia madre dava lezioni di piano. Bisognava aiutare un po' mia sorella, che era sposata con un rappresentante di commercio e aveva tre figli e non ce la faceva ad andare avanti. E bisognava mantenere mio fratello agli studi e mio padre credeva che sarebbe diventato un grand'uomo. Io andavo alle magistrali e nelle ore libere davo qualche ripetizione ai bambini della portinaia. La portinaia aveva dei parenti in campagna e ci ripagava in castagne, mele e patate. Mio fratello studiava medicina e ci volevano sempre dei soldi, ora per il microscopio, ora per i libri e le tasse. Mio padre credeva che sarebbe diventato un grande uomo. Non c'era forse una ragione per crederlo, ma lo credeva. Aveva cominciato a pensare così fin da quando Valentino era piccolo e adesso forse mi riusciva difficile smettere. Mio padre stava tutto il giorno in cucina e farneticava da solo. Si immaginava quando Valentino sarebbe stato un medico famoso e, sa e sarebbe andato ai congressi nelle grandi capitali d'Europa e avrebbe scoperto nuove medicine e malattie. 
Valentino invece non pareva che avesse voglia di diventare un grande uomo. Over to you. Thank you. Beautiful. Lovely to hear it. And um, this is the same uh, passage in English. This is the very beginning of the novella Valentino. I lived with my father, mother, and brother in a small rented apartment in the middle of town. Life was not easy and finding the rent money was always a problem. My father was a retired school teacher and my mother gave piano lessons. We had to help my sister who was married to a commercial traveler and had three children and a pitifully inadequate income. And we also had to support my student brother who my father believed was destined to become a man of consequence. I attended a teacher training college and in my spare time helped the caretaker's children with their homework. The caretaker had relatives who lived in the country and she paid in kind with the supply of chestnuts, apples, and potatoes. My brother was studying medicine and the expenses were never ending, microscope, books, fees. My father believed that he was destined to become a man of consequence. There was little enough reason to believe this, but he believed it all the same and had done, done ever since Valentino was a small boy and perhaps found it difficult to break the habit. My father spent his days in the kitchen, dreaming and muttering to himself, fantasizing about the future when Valentino would be a famous doctor and attend medical congresses in the great capitals and discover new drugs and new diseases. Valentino himself seemed devoid of any ambition to become a man of consequence. Okay. So, Cynthia, um, I'd like to ask you, um, actually, were you, do you want to ask me or should I ask you either about way. your discovery of, uh, of Natalia? Um, how, either how did way. You, how, I'll ask you first. And, okay. um, uh, how did you come to discover her work and, and how did you come to discover this work, uh, um, which you write about um, so eloquently in, in this volume, which right. pairs Valentino with... Yeah. Yes, with a very Ted nice Harris. cover too, I think, very. Very handsome, um, yes. Um, yes, and um, uh, we're very grateful to New York Review of Books for republishing these books. Um, and uh, I came across Natalia Ginsburg a very long time ago, uh, probably 30 years ago. Uh, my brother's uh, Italian teacher when he was in college was a friend of Ginsburg's in Rome. And so uh, he, uh, knowing the kind of books that I liked, he said he gave me a copy um, of The Little Virtues, uh, her book of essays in Italian, which I was then unable to read. So I went out and found the Dick Davis um, uh, translation. And the minute I opened that book, I think I really, I don't think I've really gone anywhere without the little virtues for 30 years. It's always in my book bag and her voice has really uh, never left my ear. I, so I, and at that point I was really trying to find anything I could read by her. And I think I first read the Manzoni family and then Carlo Michele and Valentino and Sagittarius, which I think had been published separately at that time, um, all in English, because that's what I could read. Also, my, um, my neighbor at the time uh, was uh, the novelist Lynn Sharon Schwartz, and she uh, did a wonderful translation of a book of essays, which she called A Place to Live, which has a essay in which um, Natalia and her second husband are looking for a new apartment, which is hilarious. And I started to teach that. And then I um, have taught other of her essays um, at Yale and in, at Princeton when I used to teach at Princeton. Um, so I think I was very much affected in The Little Virtues by I, her ideas about bringing up children. And at that time, very long time ago, I didn't have any children. But I always kept her in mind, I think it when my, uh, Daughter Rose was born and we had some naming ceremony. I read a passage from Natalia Ginsburg um, at that ceremony. And one of the things I always remembered from it was uh, 
the job of parents is to be in the next room, but not the same room, <laughs> which is a little hard with COVID sometimes now. So, and what about you? How did you come to Ginsburg? Well, I, um, I was thinking about that today and, you know, I was looking at my, um, my, my original copies of her books. Uh, so I discovered her um, w when I didn't know Italian. Uh, so I, I discovered her in English and I found her um, in sort of, um, sort of remainder piles because I have my, my paperback copy of um, Valentino and, 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 and Sagittarius is, um, it's an old English edition and it, you know, I spent, I don't know, two ninety nine or something on it. And I, so I think I found these books when I was, um, when I was a graduate student in Boston and would, um, you know, uh, browse uh, bookstores and especially the remainder piles. Um, and, uh, and that's how I discovered, um, discovered her and read her. Um, and in my incredibly, um, limited knowledge of, of contemporary Italian literature uh, before, before I moved to, to Rome in 2012. Um, she, she always had a place on my bookshelf. I had the, 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 the Lessico Familiare in English, which I had read, and, and um, these novellas. And, um, and so I knew that she was an important writer of the 20th century, um, but I had only gauged with her thus, you know, in, in a limited capacity. Um, when I moved to Rome, um, I was um, deep on my um, um, path to uh, improving my Italian, which I had since begun to study. And um, my teacher um, brought me one day to read uh, one, of the, one of the stories, um, if you will, in um, Le Piccole Virtù called um, him, him and Me, Him and I, uh, He and I, Lui e Io. Um, and, and I remember studying it. He, he had me read it to learn the use of the imperfect, uh, the imperfect tense and how it's used in narrative, right? So like Cero una volta, once upon a, once upon a time. Um, and so I was very um, struck by this. And, and of course she is, um, critics have pointed out um, that she, she was sort of a master of the imperfect tense. Right, and we see this also in 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 the the section we 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 just read. Um, it's it's entirely written in the in the imperfect, um, and and so I began reading more things by her in Italian, and I was struck in that phase when I was reading more and more in Italian how um, incredibly lucid her her prose was and how precise and 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 the more I read, the more connections I started to feel with her. Her work as as a writer, because um, uh, I mean, first of all, I think you know um, people have remarked, you have remarked uh, uh, how um, she was influenced, how much she loved Chekhov. Her husband, her first husband, Leone, was a uh, was um, a, a scholar of Russian literature. Um, so I wonder if that's how Chekhov came into her hands um, through him, perhaps. Um, and she also reminded me very much of another writer I adore and who's published by New York Review of Books, Mavis Gallant. Um, I, I, and especially in these two um, novellas that are in, 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 in the present volume we're talking about tonight, um, there are many, many uh, thematic and stylistic linkings, I think, to the work of, of Gallant, uh, especially in sort of portraits of troubled mother-daughter relationships and the whole marriage question, um, and uh, and so on and so forth, which maybe we can unpack. Um, I was fascinated by uh, also by her use of the first person. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, an enormous um, sort of characteristic of her writing, and and what she did. I mean, she really created a sort of hybrid genre way before we had words like autofiction or memoir, right? She was on the cutting edge of how to work in, in the first person and how to make it both true and invented. And, and what she did that was so um, extraordinary was, was she managed to be 
both incredibly present and at the same time utterly absent from the page. So there's this incredible contradiction running through all of her work in terms of where, where she is. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is when I, when I did um, read um, Lessico Familiare, Family Lexicon in Italian, um, and I sort of saved it until I felt that my Italian was really going to be, um, um, uh, you know, be able to appreciate um, the book in, 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 in its fullest um, capacity. Uh, I was, I was, um, I was so, um, so struck by that idea of having a private family language um, and how she describes having a private family language which was um, very much my own experience of, of childhood. Um, you know, my, my family, I was raised with two languages and my immediate family, and especially with my sister, um, my husband often remarks, uh, still, you know, you and your sister speak a different language and it's a language that nobody can, can understand. Um, and I think that often happens when there are um, maybe more than, when there's more than one language at play, but also um, just the, the, in terms of families that sort of live in a very, um, very um, sort of the family against the world kind of way. And so many of the families that she writes about, that Ginsburg writes about are families that have that kind of relationship with the outside world. So, so that's how I discovered her. And those were some of the, some, some of the things that um, stood out right away. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that um, while we were speaking about yesterday is to her extraordinary detachment. While the, the stories are so vivid, whether, she, whether it's in the autofiction or in these stories, Valentino and Sagittarius, there's a detachment, although so much is often in the first person. And I was thinking as you were speaking about how she is also the master of the epistolary novel. And one of the things about that a novel, which is written by, in the form of letters, uh, Carol Michele, uh, the Manzoni family, and the city and the house are all written in letters back and forth with various voices, is that, of course, a letter is always in the first person. So there she's using the first person again, but that first person is a kind of, um, made up of a kind of mosaic of personalities. Um, one of the things we had been thinking about is how in both Valentino and Sagittarius, it's written in the first person, but the first person is a, almost powerless fem young female person in her 20s, which was quite not the person that uh, Ginsburg herself was. And I, I um, you know, I wonder about that in terms of why she chose that. And also when I think about my own relationship to the work that on one hand, we, as writers, we put ourselves forward and we, um, write about our own lives. On the other hand, um, there is so much introspection in being a writer and that somehow in these passive female characters, she, she captures those moments of, of just watching and thinking rather than acting, which of course is also part of a writer's life. I was wondering if you identified with that at all. Because I, I, I'm thinking maybe that the, in both uh, Valentino and Sagittarius are narrated by a young woman in her 20s. They're slightly different, but their situations of being uh, socially isolated and somehow bound up by their families are almost identical. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think, I think her, her, these female characters, these female narrators are, um, I mean, they're, yes, they're passive, but they're also very active in that they're so actively absorbing. Right. And they're absorbing everything that is happening in, in a very intense way, but but I agree with you in that they're sort of like the 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 the, the camera in the in the film that doesn't move, you know, and, and the action is just sort of passing and, and the camera is there to register it. Um, and so I think and, and I think she 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 what she does um, so so effectively is she sort of um, pits these women um, who 
who don't have a lot of say in their in their lives and in their destiny. I mean, Valentino is so much about, um, you know, sort of those um, very patriarchal family dynamics in which, oh, all the money's going to go to the son because he's going to do something great. And then the women, well, all they can do is sort of either get married and have children or maybe teach or something, um, you know, something of that nature. And so she, she has characters like this who, who really don't have a lot of say um, uh, a, a, other than to register and record and, and racontare and tell the story, right? So that is their, that is their um, activity. And I think the first person really highlights that is that I am telling the story even though it wasn't my story to tell. Um, and so she pits these characters, these female characters, with very domineering women at this in within the same you know and in 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 Valentino's case it's the woman that her brother ends up marrying and and uh in in Sagittarius it's um it's the mother and 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 here and here I, I found a strong resonance for example with um maternal characters in Mavis Gallant um for example in um a set of, of, of um, long story, I guess it's a sort of a, a, a novel, I think Gallant actually called it a novel called Green Water, Green Sky, which are four distinct stories from different points of view. But there you have you know, an extraordinary mother, um, sort of utterly self-absorbed mother, um, similar to Ginsburg. So I think that she is, um, she is exploring motherhood and pregnancy and childhood uh, in so many of her stories, in so many of her novels, um, in so many iterations. Uh, I think um, this is something that certainly as I grew older and also became a mother, a wife and then a mother, you know, um, there, you know, added, um, so there's added resonance uh, uh, in reading her. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I think that there's always a contradiction in her, in her work. You know, there's always that under under layer. Um, it's never what what it seems to be. Um, characters aren't who they seem to be. You know, and 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 certainly Valentino is all about that. And and if you even look, if you look closely at the language here in the passage that we read, you know, in you know the father, she's very clear to repeat. She's very careful to repeat twice in two consecutive paragraphs. Um, that my father believed he was destined to become a man of consequence. And she says it once, and then she says it again. And then Valentino himself seemed devoid of any ambition to become a man of consequence. So she, 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 she says, well, her father, the father might have thought this thing, but Valentino had something else to say. You know, and in, 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 in the Italian, we have the, the wonderful word invece, you know, which is sort of this, you know, well, this may be this, this happening over here, but on the other hand, you know, on the contrary, um, he had his own thoughts about his life and, and the story really unfolds that and shows us that he, that he had his own vision for his life. And it, he, of course, ends up leading without giving too much away a completely different life from what his father had envisioned. Right. One of the things that's coming to mind, you know, as you're, we're talking about this is, especially in Sagittarius, um, a parallel I hadn't really thought of before is the parallel to Mrs. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice, because her, she is that same kind of overbearing, completely self-absorbed person as Madalena is uh, in, in Valentino. And she is so intent on Julia having the right kind, uh, kind of marriage when Julia ends up marrying a, a um, a uh, doctor who seems like quite a lovely person, but somehow does not fit her idea of um, the the type of marriage she would have liked um, Julia to have. He goes around seeing his parents on his patients on a motor scooter, which she finds absolutely unbearable. And then Madalena takes a, in Val, in Valentino takes over everybody's life. The the um, narrator there her biggest hope her what she really likes is to go and walk to the store to do the shopping a mile away because it's a beautiful walk and um madalena decides that why should she be doing that 
she should be getting the vet, she'll give her the vegetables. So there's this feeling of people's lives being taken over and, and almost, there's almost a kind of um, pleasure in a way in giving in to these stronger forces I find in the books. There's an undercurrent of, of just giving up, um, not having to put oneself forward, which is interesting too. Um, I think that the, I, I, what I'm curious about is whether you feel, because I certainly feel that Ginsburg's prose as with its um, absolute attention to detail and rigor um, is something that I've kept in my mind really all the time um, as trying to, um, you know, a, a a goal never to be realized would be to write those kind of sentences that are, they are so clear. It's as though she, she never um, wavers um, in her attention to detail and her sort of quiet restraint. Uh, there's almost never any hyperbole, uh, any exaggeration, just a kind of slow chipping away at, um, um, the facades, I guess, of personality. She doesn't state any, there, there are never any blanket statements. It's always in the details. Have you have found that you keep her voice in your head as your, and, and is the voice I'm assuming of her work for you is in Italian? It, it, it is, it is. I, I have now sort of, you know, when I read her, I, I, I read her in Italian. I also, I, t I, t I teach her at Princeton. So when I teach her, depending on what, what um, type of course I'm teaching, whether I'm teaching in English or Italian, um, sometimes I teach in both. Uh, um, but I, so I look at her closely in, in Italian uh, in my, with my students who have Italian. And then I, you know, I look closely at the translations as well. And in fact, we've done um, comparative work. Uh, Lynn uh, Sharon Schwartz is also, um, I know her as well, and she actually came to uh, a translation workshop I led here a couple of years ago um, that was called To and From Italian. And so, you know, students were translating in and out of Italian with, with Italian and English. And so one of the, one of the um, writers we looked at was, was Ginsburg and, and one of her um, essays in the little virtues, um, and uh, so I mean, I I think that I mean I agree with you. I mean, she's a master of understatement, um, and she, you know, she as along with so many of her contemporaries, um, uh, her you know fellow writer friends um, and colleagues, uh, Pavese, whom she of course lost to to his suicide and 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 wrote about um, and was was um, um, uh, severely you know shaken by um, and also Calvino. I mean, this whole generation of writers are are being are reading American literature in translation. Right, this is one of their main activities: is they're right. reading Hemingway, they're reading um, Steinbeck, they're reading these um, North American uh, writers. And, and I think that in that sense, you know, we can start tracing lines back to their reading, albeit in, in Italian translation of writers like Hemingway, for example, right? Um, right. And, and, so, um, and so I think that there's, there is a lot of, um, you know, there, there is a lot to, 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 to think about in that regard in terms of how she, um, as you say, um, in, I think in your review of, of um, Lessico Familiare about how like the late Shakespeare tragedies, so much of the, the real, you know, the tragic action is happening off stage. And, and this, is, this is indeed the case in many of her works, um, not uh, incidentally in a, in a story, in the story that I included in my anthology of Italian short stories um, that I put together a couple of years ago, I included a story called Mio Marito, my husband, mm -hmm. um, and that was actually the story. So I know I know three members of of of, 
Ginsburg's family. I know two of her children and I know one of her grandchildren. And so when I was putting my anthology together, I, I, I reached out to Alessandra, her daughter. And um, I said, you know, I'm putting together this book of Italian short stories. And of, of course, I, I have to right, include a story by your mother because I love her so much. And she said, oh, well, um, I think she would have really liked it if you included Mio Marito. So of course I did. Um, and in that story, which is also, you also have there, you know, sort of passive female narrator um, who's in a marriage and she's, um, you know, her husband is betraying her uh, with, a, with a younger woman. And there, there's a, there's a grave. I mean, it's a very intense story and there's a, you know, a, a, an immense tragedy um, in that story um, that she witnesses. You know that she she is privy to, and in fact, it's the husband who's off stage when that happens. So I think it's it's interesting when she chooses to right. go there and present, um, and when and when it's an offhand mention. When in the entire you know lesico familiare, you know, there's one line kind of saying, "Oh, by the way, my husband, my first husband, died." Um, well, we have that in Winter in Abruzzi where which is a wonderful essay in, in The Little Virtues about the time in which um, they were in the country in exile in the Abruzzi. And, and it's a evocation of um, what the houses were like and what the meatballs were like and what the um, bloods were like and how the villagers don't like her, think she's crazy because she takes the children out for a walk in the snow. and. It's very, you know, almost cozy in its depiction of their life there. And then at the very, at, but she keeps saying how she can't, she wants to go back to their regular life. And then in the very last paragraph of this essay, she says that her husband has been killed um, um, in prison. And that, I think that, and, and in La um, Sago Familiare is the really only mention she, you know, of, of this obviously extraordinarily painful time in her life. It's, it's only alluded to. Um, she doesn't go into any detail about it, which when you look at the way people write today about everything that happens to them in great detail, it's a different kind of, um, of stance about how things happen. And it is a bit like, um, like, um, the late plays of Shakespeare in which whatever, all the things that happen, happen off stage. Um, uh, I, think, I think if I'm remembering correctly in Cara Michele, that death also does, happens by the way, you never see it happen. And it's all by inference. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's always um, the story behind the story in Ginsburg. Yeah. Yeah, and but there, I do think again. I mean, I, I do think she 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 surely read, you know, she read Hemingway. I know she met Hemingway, and I think one of the interesting um, sort of syntactical things they share is this um, penchant for um, for polysyndeton. You know, this 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 it, and 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 that is all over the place in her work, and we see it in the in the beginning of Valentino, right? And and the punctuation is very different in the, in the Italian. And of course the translator has to kind of work with that to make it, make it you know, um, correspond to English rhythms. But even as I was reading it, I, was, I noticed that there are these, you know, these and sentences that are beginning with and, and then there's another and, and you know, she's just stringing things together that, that to me, you know, you know, I just think of my, you know, my study of Hemingway and his, his love of those, those sentences that are, that are um, that the ands are the connective tissue um, so often. Well, we were noticing when we were looking at it yesterday, the first paragraph. It really, um, it it it's it's almost like a series of drawbridges because there's one semicolon after another. Mm -hmm. So it's as though you're going further, and you know everything is an explanation of the thing that went before. So you're going. It's almost as though you're being pulled close further and further into the story. Mm -hmm but having to go past these gates. And then, as you said, you have Invece, which is, well, and then on the other hand, he doesn't want to become a man of consequence at all. And these um, 
in, in family lexicon, uh, which is really about, as you were saying, about a kind of family patois. In Valentino, the, the phrase, becoming a man of, con of consequence occurs throughout the book, that this is the tagline for Valentino, that he would become a, a um, man of consequence. And I, there are ways in which uh, the language of the books keep repeating. And as uh, I think you were mentioning yesterday, that the objects in the books repeat again and again. So mm -hmm. that we keep coming back to these almost ta not only talismanic sayings, but talismanic objects. In Valentino, it's uh, uh, all, all the um, things that Valentino is given by Madalena, his gold watch and his ski clothes for someone who never goes skiing, um, the little dish of dried pears that um, Katerina uh, eats when she goes for the first time in a, on a country outing with Kit those keep coming back, the little dolls. So mm -hmm. it's almost like a um, collage really puts together. And so that the, all of these things, the words and the objects fit together to make a, a living thing, which is the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she loves objects, right? And she, she loves repeating them. Um, it's a very distinctive, aspect of her writing i i think and i mean and here might be important to 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 note that if, you know of course she translated proust so we have that kind of um rhythmic force as well you know she 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 translates um swan's way beautifully i i've read her translation um it's gorgeous and and so i think she's you know she she's a wonderful um you know, crossroads of so much of her, her reading and her translation work. And, and of course she was, you know, she had a job, she was an editor. Um, so she was so, she, she was reading so widely. Um, and, and I imagine, I imagine, <laughs> I never knew her, but I imagine that much like her, many of her female protagonists, what she probably shared with them is, if not their, their literal passivity um, as women, as mothers, et cetera. But I think that idea of, of actively, ferociously absorbing her reading, you know, which is what writers do. Uh, um, but, but I think she was, she excelled at that. And I think her, her, her activity as not only as a writer, um, but as an editor. Um, and she also, you know, she was, um, she was very politically engaged, you know, she was a very a member of parliament person. So, um, so she had that aspect of her, of her as well, which is a very outward, um, active role to have, um, in, in, in society. And, 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 and so, um, so I think that she's, you know, I, I, I imagine that her, her prose, her, her very distinctive prose, her inimitable prose, um, you know, has many, you know, it's sort of a palimpsest of so many of, of um, these authors she must have been absorbing. And she's, I mean, highly literary, you know, like Inverno in Abruzzo, Winter in Abruzzo begins with a, um, with an epigraph from Virgil. Right. Um, my husband, Mio Marito, has a citation from the Bible. Um, she's, she's talking to other texts. Um, she's very, um, explicit about that in her incredibly kind of discreet way you know but she was she was both things she was wonderfully contradictory right she was both very detached and then very much in the thick of it you know she'll she will talk in a what her, her um hilarious essay which is translated in english as he and i about how her husband likes to charge off in a million different places and she just wants to lie on the couch and stare at the ceiling. But you feel like some, you know, it's, um, it's um, that she did occasionally get up from that couch <laughs> and do quite a lot of things. Um, I think w w one thing, you know, on this sort of more political note um, is that, you know, of course her first book is translate is published sorry um, under a pseudonym not because she chooses to 
No, but because, because she has to. She, she has, has to. She can't publish otherwise. She's Jewish, and um, the racial laws have been passed. And and a Naudi, you know, her publisher says you need to um, publish this under a false name, and and I think that is also something to ponder, given that you know just the 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 fact that a writer cannot that cannot publish in her with her name so it's that that another way in which the i of natalia is compromised right is 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 um is prohibited um and then eventually she she republishes and you know her name is there and you know um but i have a copy of that of that first book of the first with book. her with her pseudonym on it mm-hmm. um and um you know so I, I just that strikes me that 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 was her beginning as a writer was you know her published public beginning as a writer was not in her own name and not because not because she chose to right that that's a different that's a different you know so whatever you know if we're speaking about Ferrante or whomever right. people who choose to have to publish under a, an invented name but but in this case it wasn't her choice at all no she didn't choose that and um You know, I, I wonder, I wonder a little bit about how she, um, you know, when she, she always says that, she always would say that her terse style came from the fact that she was the youngest child and could never get a word ed, in edgewise. And I think that that um, stance of the youngest child uh, stays in, in her books in a way because she is always watching. And that's youngest children do that, um, trying to find a way into the the family um, the family lexicon, trying to uh, observe it and seeing when it's her time to dart in. And I I think we see that a little bit in both of the protagonists uh, in um, Valentino and Sagittarius is that while they are extremely passive, there are moments of assertion in both place in both. Um, in both books, where the speaker, um, uh, the act of assertion, as I think you said, is is that they're writing it at all. They're telling the story. They're the witness to the story. But there are moments of independence. I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to do it my way, which seem even more radical because they are in inside such a, a constricted environment that the smallest movement out is a radical movement. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's that incredible questions. Or? Um, oh, sure, we can take some questions. Uh, how how's it how does it work? I'm back, and I'll handle the questions for the two of you. Okay. I was just looking at the time. <laughs> no, we're good. That was that was just perfect. Um, so our first question: Can you talk about how Ginsburg's political activities as an anti-fascist during the war, and then later as a member of Parliament, is reflected in the topics of her work? Well, in, um, certainly in, in, I guess we're using the title of the New, uh, the New York Review translation of Family Lexicon, is a book about her family. Um, and they were a prominent anti-fascist family. Her brothers were um, prominent in, in that movement and her father, certainly her brother Alberto and her, her father ended up in jail. Um, so it's very much about that time in, in her life. Um, as far also Carol Michele is a book about a uh, son of a family who becomes a political activist and uh, disappears. So I'm, and then uh, can you think of other instances? Well, I mean, I think just simply from the family angle itself, I mean, fascism revered the family. Fascism was all about, you know, the sanctity of the family. And how this was such an important, you know, aspect of 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 a fascist society and fascist culture. You know, you, you had to be in a family, and you had to um, make a family, and you and women had to have make children. You know, and and the whole thing. Like this was the whole vision. Um, and I think that her so much of her work is is looking at how incredibly dysfunctional the family is. Right. She's looking at it again oh. and again. You know, so her work is incredibly subversive 
in that in that regard because she's constantly shining light on you know um insane parents who don't appreciate their children um you know um wayward children um you know couples who clearly should not be together um and 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 so on and so forth i mean all the the stuff of literature in the end but she really goes she really has you know has a consistent focus on on the family and 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 as i said sort of you know um the underbelly of the italian family and the messiness um, of it and the the messiness of it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um in almost all her books uh one of the concerns of her books um in terms of family is how mm -hmm. adults behave badly and how children are hurt by that and how children end up neglected so, and she then, um, in, in, towards the end of her life, she took up the cause of a Filipino orphan, Serena Cruz, who had been adopted by an Italian family and then the courts overruled it. And, and uh, she was also interested in the, pl in the plight of Cambodian children and wrote about that. So mm -hmm. I think uh, politics, you know, really, I, I don't think politics was really separate from the way she thought about her life. Mm -hmm. Well, in that sense, I think she, again, I mean, I, I, I think there would be, you know, if I had spare time, um, a, a case to be made for, for the parallels between Ginsburg and, and, and Gallant um, is, um, there's a lot of material there because Gallant was also very politically engaged, but this one of her great themes was this sort of, you know, what happens to children at the hands of neglectful adults. And, you know, cruel, cruel slash neglectful adults, um, which which we see very much in Ginsburg's work. Um, and I wonder if um, if Gallant read her. Um, That'd be interesting perhaps, to find out. Know, maybe there was some cross pollination there. Who knows? Um, a, a good transitional question from that. Um, how does the language of the family, uh, uh, or that of some of the family members, differ from the language of the outside world in Ginsburg's work? Well, I mean, she talks specifically in the family lexicon, for example, of the words, the sort of the, the words they substitute for conventional words. Mm -hmm. and this is, of course, also very anti-fascist mm -hmm. because fasc fascism was about, you know, Italian with a capital I and without any deviation. Um, and so family lexicon is all about how when you're in a family, language is deviated um, and you, you begin to create your own your own secret codes for communication and you substitute you swap out words you say we don't want to use the word book for book we're going to create another word that only we know um, and, we and you know there's all sorts of things in family lexicon you knitter wit and you know these have been translated in different ways but the family have different names for each other they're they're they don't use um standard Italian to describe um, uh, what they see around them. They, they invent their own words and some of them are really funny. For example, the psychiatrist is referred to it in the family as the lunatic because he's a psychiatrist, things like that. So um, I think it's the idea of the family creating a world which is separate from the world outside, a, a different kind of haven with its own language. Um, our next question, in these novellas, in Happiness as Such, and in Family Lexicon, the mothers have narrow lives, but they notice and document what everyone else is doing. Do you think that Ginsburg is telling us that there is still, that there is still meaningfulness or creative work in their clarity of expression? In, in their meaning, I'm not quite sure I understood that. Meaning one. in their maternal work? Or if there's still, if, if the clarity of their expression, let's see. Do you think that Ginsburg is telling us that there is still meaningfulness, creative work in their clarity of expression? So I guess that the, the question is really, given that the mothers are sort of the documentarians of the family, um, is there some kind of creative work involved in that role? In the, in the role of, a, of the mother? Mm -hmm. I, 
I would say that she certainly feels that there's creative work in the role of the mother. Um, and and uh, in Valentino and Sagittarius, uh, the, in the first, the mother is almost completely passive. And in the second, she's, she is trying to rule the roost. Um, in Family Lexicon, it's a portrait of um, Ginsburg's mother, who in some ways held the family together emotionally, I think, um, throughout that time. Um, her and uh, certainly um, did in Ginsburg's life when she was living in Rome after the war. Her mother took care of the children in the country. Her, she was um, devoted. Her mother was devoted to her and to her children. So I, I certainly don't think that she she means to denigrate in any way the role of the mother. Um, and being a mother was indeed very important to her. Um. Next question, you've spent time, and you both spent time and written about life in Rome. Uh, what do you see of Rome, and then I guess Italy more, more largely in Ginsburg's work from each of your experiences um, having spent time there? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I just think of her, I mean, her, first of all, Leone is, is killed in a Roman prison, right? So I think, um, and she wasn't, she wasn't based in Rome um, at that point. Um, and, and so that uh, trauma takes place in, in a city that she will then eventually go to um, and remain tied to um, for the rest of her life, and, you know. Um, not all of her work is 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 set in Rome, um, but you know she was she moved around in her life. You know she lived in um, she was born in in Palermo in Sicily, and then she was raised in Torino in the north, and then she had this period of, of being in exile. Um, she lived then many many years in Rome. Um, she also lived in London a city she hated, right. uh, but where she was incredibly productive and, and, um, um, and, and wrote um, some of her uh, most powerful works. Um, so I, I think that she's, um, you know, I, when I think of her, I don't think of her only as a Roman writer, right? I don't, you know, there, there are certain writers, right? Like Elsa Morante, for example, you know, is she sort of embodies Rome. Um, in, in, in a way that um, Ginsburg does, but that's not all that's going on in her work um, because that wasn't all that was going on in her life. And she was in much more in movement. Um, and, um, but I think of her because, you know, just personally, because, you know, I met her family members because of my, you know, life in Rome and, um, so in that sense, you know, I know where she lived. I know exactly where her building was. You know, I know that, that she, she took part in the life of the, of the city. And, um, and so in that sense, she's very much anchored, of course. Um, is there a fundamentally feminist spirit in Ginsburg's reclaiming of traditionally private and domestic first person genres, i.e. the diary or the epistolary novel uh, in post-fascist Italy? Well, I mean, it's interesting. I'm teaching a class on the diary this semester at Princeton. Um, and so those that they have been very much on my mind. Um, I mean, diaries are written by men and women. Um, one of the most beautiful literary diaries to come out of um, the 20th century in Italy was, of course, Pavese's diary, um, which I'm about to teach in a couple of weeks. Um, but I, I think the diary is, um, is, is certainly an intimate form of writing, um, as, as are letters, but even more intimate form of writing because you're writing for yourself um, and, 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 and with yourself and to yourself. Um, so I think in that sense, you know, um, the idea of the private at uh, the intimate sphere can be very destabilizing, you know, in, you know, when you're talking about fascism, 
right? Because it's the other side of, of the day you just spent. Um, it's what you really feel. Um, and there are things that could be, you know, that can be, that can be quite dangerous to reveal. Um, but I believe the question was linked more to, to feminism, correct? Yes. I don't, which I don't really, I'm not sure. I, women have always written diaries and um, I'm not sure that she would consider herself I, I, you may know this better than I do, but I don't think of her, of um, Ginsburg classing herself as a feminist writer, or I think she, she had an extraordinarily strong character and, and wrote what she felt she wanted to write at the time, but I don't think she was writing it for any particular cause in that way. Um, but, you know, we don't have her diary. She, we don't have a diary that she wrote. She wasn't, as far as I know, a diarist or have public, you know, what she wrote, she wrote to have people read. Well, uh, Italian feminism also really doesn't get off the ground until the much later. And so she's already written a lot of stuff, <laughs> stuff before, before it even becomes yeah. the kind of, you know, um, Thing. Uh, a cause. Um, I think of her as a, as a feminist, you know, I mean, I, think of myself as a feminist. I think of any, you know, I, I want to think of her in that sense as a, as a feminist. Yeah, she was a very strong women, woman who believed in, um, in, 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 in her voice and in her right to participate and create. And, um, and, and, and she was working, you know, um, in the world alongside men in a man's world. Italian publishing is still, you know, outrageously sort of male dominated. Um, very few women have won the Strega Prize. She's one of them. Um, but you know, so the fact that she was so engaged, so involved, such a public figure in that sense, um, I, I think she's an extraordinary beacon. Um, she must have been an extraordinary beacon for women. I mean, I, I have many Italian women writer friends, and I think, you know, they, they really look to her as a they would say as a faro, as a, you know, their lighthouse. Um, the other thing I think that's important is that most, almost all of her books are about domestic life and they're about women and they're about women's lives and um, how they're, how, how women make their way through their, the world, through the domestic sphere, through their romances, through um, the world, uh, the world of work in some ways. So, uh, that was her subject matter. Okay, we're going to take one last question and then we'll wrap things up. Um, how is Ginsburg regarded in Italy as opposed to uh, Frante, who seems to have become more of a popular figure, figure in North America than Ginsburg? Not even really seems to. They're, you know, the, the Ferrante uh, industry. So how is she regarded in Italy? Yeah, with, with regards to Ferrante, um, or, or any of the breakout Italian writers who have, who have really crossed over into American um, publishing? Well, I wouldn't want to put anyone in opposition or in competition with each other. You know, they're very different writers and Fronte's obviously written some wonderful books that people really like to read. <laughs> um, and they've, you know, for various reasons, including, uh, the industriousness of their translator, the wonderful Anne Goldstein, they've, they've cut quite a swath here. I think uh, Ginsburg tends to write smaller books. She, uh, the Manzoni family is the only kind of big book that she wrote, and most of her novels are short. Um, so I think they have a, a not a, a, diff, a kind of different tone, but I, you know, she is certainly held in extraordinarily high regard in Italy. Agreed. I, 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 I think she's, she's an enormous figure for, you know, every, every writer I know reveres and, her. Yeah. Um, and Ginsburg is one of the great writers of the 20th century. Um, and not just in Italy, really. Um, I don't, it's very hard to think of, of many writers of her rank, at least to my mind. Uh, well, that is as good a period to put on this as any. Um, 
Thank you, Jhumpa and Cynthia, for joining us tonight uh, to discuss Ginsburg's work. Um, we're all big fans of the bookstore. And uh, as I mentioned to everyone at the start of the event, I'm just going to scroll up here and grab this link one more time before we leave and post it in the chat. That is a link to buy Valentino and Sagittarius, if you would like to, from the bookstore. Um, it's tremendous work, and we're so happy to have it in translation now from NYRB Classics. Um, as a reminder, we're going to continue our, our NYRB Classics series um, through October into November and December, so please sign up for a newsletter if you'd like to know more. Um, so just one more thanks again, Shumpa and Cynthia, and we're going to wrap up tonight um, wishing everyone well, safety, health, all. Okay, thank you very much for having us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Your pleasure. Good night. <laughs>